there's a word from the Lord of today. It's going to come from 1 Samuel 13, 13 to 14. And I'll put a pin there. Acts 13 uh, and 22. That's the second scripture. First scripture is 1 Samuel 13, 13 to 14. And the second scripture is going to be the book of Acts chapter 13, verse 22. How many of y'all got your paper Bibles today? Your paper Bibles? How many? Can I see them? Can I see? Can y'all hold up them Bibles? Yeah, hold that word. Wow. You know what they used to say in my old church? When you are, when you really got them paper Bibles, you're not just saved. You save, save. You, you save twice. <laughs> In Jesus' name, you say, say for real. First, first Samuel 13, 13 to 14, and uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 22. How many enjoying the sermon series so far? I've got problems. Yes, I've got weight problems. Not everything is sin. You know, the biggest one, the one that was really hanging, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to judge and say it's for most of y'all, but procrastination, that really hit. Man, it made me feel like, man, I'm lazy. Yeah, I'm 39 years old, and I'm like, I'm lazy, 39. I'm so lazy. I just put things off all the time. But it really challenged me to go forth and really not procrastinate. It's not so much that it's a sin as much as it's a weight, something that kind of can hold you back. Amen? Amen. And also confidence problems, the story of Gideon. How many, have, how many uh, confidence were restored last week? How many coming out their tents? Oh, yeah, I get the revelation coming out of your tent with your confidence. All right, all right, all right, all right. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solicit a, 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 an amen corner, okay? This is my first time preaching, okay? I need y'all to shout me down when something good is said, when God says something good, not me. I'm just a vessel. When God says something good, I'm going to solicit some amen. So can I get a Amen. In Jesus' name. Last time, 1 Samuel 13, 13 to 14, Acts 13, 22. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Acts 13 verse 22. And when he removed him, we're talking about Saul, when he removed Saul, he raised up for them, which was Israel, David as king. To whom also he gave testimony. Understand, the Bible is testifying to David the fact that I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, who will do what? All my will. Not some. Somebody say all. All, all my will. The title of my message today that God wanted me to share with his wonderful people is I've got heart problems. Now, listen, it's going to be a little tight. It's a little tight. I know it's right. So just gently, just touch your name. Just gently, gently, gently just touch them and just say, I've, I've got heart problems. I've got heart problems. Let me pray for y'all. We need some prayer right now. Woo, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, for these wonderful people in this room. There is not many seats, Lord God, that are not filled, and it's because they came hungry. They came searching for a word from God. So, Father, Lord God, I pray that you open up their hearts and that you open up their ears, Lord God, that they're getting ready to receive manna fresh from heaven. I pray, Lord God, that they eat well on this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's thank God for our wonderful musician. I know y'all used to seeing me over there. But this man over here has been slaying all morning. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful gift. Amen. Clap your hands for him one more time. Clap your hands for the worship team. I, I, listen, I be feeling the glory up here, but the glory right here when the worship be going on, this is something, you know, right here. This just be happening, right? In Jesus' name. 
Let me give you a quick history of, 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 of 1 Samuel, okay, of the scripture you read, 1 Samuel 13. So going back a few chapters, okay, uh, in 1 Samuel 9 and 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, the prophet Samuel actually anoints Saul as king of Israel and gives him an instruction to go down to a city named Gilgal, okay? And I'm going to, he says that I'm going to meet you there in seven days and we're going uh, to offer sacrifices unto God. This is Samuel giving the instruction to Saul. And now we find ourselves here in the beginning of chapter 13, uh, we see that Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, went and attacked the Philistines, and they started to lose. Okay, so Israel's losing here, and their situation kind of became critical. The Bible says so they began to hide in caves and hide behind the rocks, and uh, so that they can hide themselves from the Philistines. And the Philistines, if you read across the Samuel, you start to see that these these guys were consistently after. It was like persistent. Okay, so the Philistines were a big deal. They were very annoying for a lack of better words in Jesus name amen now Saul who remained in Gil in Gilgal he was started to follow the instruction that 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 Samuel the prophet Samuel gave him he waited the seven days good job Samuel arrived uh to offer this uh to uh, Samuel arrived and he actually was there at that time getting ready to meet Saul at that particular moment right so now Saul was eager to actually seek the Lord's favor because his man began, uh, his men, okay, because remember the Philistines were under attack against them. They began to, they were losing the battle, so a lot of his men began to scatter. So when Saul didn't see that Samuel arrived yet on the seventh day, he went ahead and offered the sacrifice. Hmm? And immediately after he offered the sacrifice, Samuel arrives. And man, I got a sermon title just from that scripture alone. Y'all want to hear the sermon title? Yeah. Obey even in the midst of chaos. Because chaos will make you rush and fall into disobedience. And we find ourselves here now in 1 Samuel chapter 13, 13 and 14. Now, uh, I would like to shift our focus just a tad bit, okay? Uh, we're going to follow, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna track David's story, a man, a, a man after God's own heart. And uh, although he was a man after God's own heart, he did come to face a few problems, right? And some of the problems he encountered weren't exactly all his fault, yet some of them were. Let's examine some of these problems and see if we can kind of empathize and kind of you know, walk in his shoes a little bit. Can we do that? So uh, if you're a good note taker, okay, like the pastor says, you're a good note taker, you're a devil slayer in Jesus name. Uh, these are just some problems I believe that flow from the heart. All right. Number one, say people problems. People. I say shout it. Say people problems. People. We all have them. I identify them as haters. Anybody got haters in the room? Anybody? Uh, I'm, uh, am I the only one? Y'all gonna be my quiet side today. Praise the Lord. I got a big... Y'all got haters in the room? Oh, all right. Now, I thought so. I wasn't by myself. I'm talking to the folk that really can't stand your presence. Have you ever had a co... Let me give you an example. Have you ever had a co-worker or a friend who could just never stand to see you succeed? Someone who really has anything positive to say? Someone who can't stand to see you victorious or someone who can't stand to see what the prophetic word of the year expand. We've all got haters, right? We got people like that. Well, David had a huge people problem so much so his life was at risk. So let's look at the passage of scripture from First uh, Samuel 1 18 6 to 9. Let's put the scripture on the screen as they put it on the screen online. Welcome. I didn't welcome you, but I love you in Jesus name. Just continue to fire away in the chat. And as I continue to shout, as I continue to preach this word unto these people. Amen. Amen. Let's see. Yes. First Samuel 18 69. Now it happened as they were coming home. When David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the woman had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. I, I, I caught something I just seen. I seen the first service. They met to, they came to meet King Saul. Yeah, they came to meet King Saul. But the next one had Saul all stirred up because he thought, he's like, yeah, I'm about to get my praise on today. They're about to, yeah, tell me about myself. Yeah, yeah. Guess what he's, they said? They said, Saul saying his thousands. 
y'all looking at the next word and laughing, right? Y'all looking at the... And David, his ten thousands. Then Saul was what? Very angry. And the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. And to me, they have ascribed only thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Listen, as you continue to grow in your faith, you better believe you're going to find people who are not happy with your success, with your accomplishments. But I do want to bring balance because I'm a good pastor now. I'm an associate pastor. This is my first sermon, so I got to bring you good balance, okay? All right? In Jesus' name. What does the Bible say and what does Jesus say in big, bold, red letters? In the book of Matthew 5 and 44 to 45, this is your balance. Love your enemies. I said, love your enemies. And bless those who what? Who curse you. Do good to those who hate. That's, hate is a strong word, right? And what the Bible say, do, do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be what? That you may be sons of of your father in heaven. Here's another problem I saw David face. He faced some personal problems. I'm talking about self-inflicted problems. We're talking about the heart, right? Anybody have uh, uh, situations where uh, they kind of caused their own problems and kind of had to walk out, you know, the, 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 the issues of the mistake that they made? I see your hand raised in the back. Amen. Praise God. Anybody uh, ever planned out their sins before? <laughs> down to the very detail yeah some of us were really good at it I mean we were like professional sinners like at the, at the at, at, you know we were professionals at doing the things we weren't supposed to be doing so most of us are familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba right at the time where kings were supposed to be off to war around springtime David woke up in the evening and saw a woman bathing on the rooftop and this woman was very beautiful so he said he sent messengers to inquire of her and found out that she was Bathsheba, wife of Uriah. So David's messengers, he got his minions to bring her back and to lie with this woman. She became pregnant. Then if that wasn't enough, he fetched for Uriah. He was at war. He came out of the war. He says, you know, who was the husband? And, and, and uh, now we start to see, you know, some of these serious issues flowing out of David's heart, right? After several attempts to get Uriah to go home to be with his wife, he sent him back to war to put him in the heat of the battle where it was most fiercest, and eventually Uriah loses his life. So soon after, the Lord sends Nathan, Nathan the prophet. So the, chapter, the next chapter, he sends Nathan the prophet to tell him of his error. But I love David's response. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. So we find out quickly after this issue that David created caused him to go through some personal problems in his family and I challenge you guys to go home and really study that because you start to see some of the real issues that he faced and there were some tough issues these are some self-inflicted issues that he had to walk out amen? amen but I do want to highlight he did say I have sinned against the Lord he didn't make excuses for his issues see part of overcoming your heart problems is not making excuses for your shortfalls. Amen? So let's look at a few examples as, uh, uh, as how God views the heart. Can we do that for a second? <clears throat> the word heart is actually mentioned. This, is, this was crazy. It's actually mentioned 895 times. 800, that's almost a thousand times the word is mentioned. So through your heart, many decisions are made, right? Makes sense. So let me give you a few scriptures. Jeremiah 17 and 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Matthew 5 and 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? They shall see. Amen. They shall see God. When your heart is pure, God becomes more vivid in your life God begins to put things in focus and begins to th make things more clear for you as you continue to seek him with a pure heart amen 
Psalms 26 and 2. Examine me, O Lord. This is an invitation into the most secret place of a person. Right. Examine me means, God, I, 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 I'm wide open. Right. I'm wide open. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try the reins of my heart. In this psalm here, you can see that David is inviting God into his space. He's inviting God to the most vulnerable place of man, his heart. And we ought to do the same. Ask God to examine your hearts and your motives. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart with all diligence. Why? Because out of the issues, out of the heart flows the issues of what? Inviting God into your heart, inviting God into your heart will help you understand your motives your actions, and just flat out why you do things. It will cause you to understand why the decisions that I make are either fruitful or fruitless. What's in your heart is either going to manifest in words or in deeds, which means we're going to see it one way or another. So now we've identified some of the problems. So here's really I would really like to focus the message of today, okay? How to, if you're taking notes, okay, I'm going to give you three points on how to overcome my heart problems. Okay, you want to, we, we want to be better for this year, right? Yeah. Listen, I, I shared in the last service that this is the year of expansion, right? This is the year that God proclaimed over the year that our pastors laid out and said, God, what are you saying on this year? And the devil would have no other better job to do than to make sure that you miss out on your expansion. The analogy I gave the first service, the analogy God gave me is Shane, listen, listen, can you, see, you, ever, you ever seen a balloon really expanding? Like you saying that thing is getting ready to blow. Yes, thank God, give it all to me until I'm ready to blow, God. Yes, in Jesus' name. But, but I could see the devil with this little pin like, yeah, yeah, you're going to get all that, but you ain't deal with your heart, though. So uh, 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 you're going to get all that, but your confidence is weak, bro. Like. Yeah, yeah, you're going you're gonna to get all that, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, you can't really handle your expansion because you just didn't deal with your issues. That's why I feel like this sermon series to start the top of the year, and we're fasting? There is no way I'm going to forfeit this expansion. There is no way I'm going to drop. I wish I had a praiser in the room that somebody said, I'm not going to drop the ball this year. This is the year I do it right in Jesus' name by God's grace. Yeah, we're going to make some mistakes along the way. We might trip. You know, we might stumble, but we're not going to fall in Jesus' name. We're going to get everything that God has for us. How to overcome my heart problems. Number one, somebody shout honor. 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 David <laughs> never dishonored the king. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say that David in 1 Samuel 18, 14, behaved wisely in all his ways. And the Lord was what? The Lord was with him. Yeah. So, so, so if, if I could put a little uh, a pause here, uh, show you something I saw in the text. It says that the Lord was with him, right? Which is letting me know and letting you know that God understands the frustration in dealing with someone who doesn't really care for you. You have to understand how well beha- how well behaved would you be if someone was out to kill you? <laughs> David only could have accomplished this because the Lord was with him. Yes, the person after David was the Lord's anointed, praise God. But we don't just honor up, we honor down as well. We honor everyone who God brings into our life, co-workers, friends, good or bad, because we never know who God is going to use to bless you. You never know who God is going to use to help catapult you into your next season, which is why you have to honor everyone. Somebody say everyone. 1 Samuel 18 and 14, a true testament to the maturity of your heart is how well you behave. David encountered Saul on many occasions and had the opportunity to take him out. But David knew Saul was still the Lord's anointed. He honored his position. Amen. 
Listen to this. Later on, later on, in, later on in 2 Samuel chapter 1, we learn about Saul's death, right? So an Amalekite actually escaped uh, a war that was going on at that time and confesses to David uh, that he was actually the one. I, I killed Saul. He, he came out. He was like, yeah, I'm actually the one. I, so let me read it to you. 2 Samuel first, uh, verse 1, 13 to 16 uh, in the New King James Version. And it says that David said unto the young men, uh, that told him, where are you from? And he answered, I'm an alien in Amalekite. Verse 14, David said unto him, how was it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called on the young man and said, go near and execute him. So he got somebody to come and put this man out. So David said unto him, verse 16, your blood is on your own head. For your own, my, your own mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. David shows honor even after the king's death. David always honors Saul even though Saul didn't care for him. Even though you feel as though someone doesn't care for you, the Bible is teaching us to honor them. I know it may seem difficult. I know it may seem hard, but this is why we have the power of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. And if that wasn't enough honor... We, we find out later that David honors Saul's family in 2 Samuel 9. I'll let you read that one when you get home. 2 Samuel 9. David asked after Saul's death, is there not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, the, the kindness of God? And David then honors Saul's grandson, and y'all don't make fun of me when I pronounce this name, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. M Mephibosheth, yes, 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 yes. The, he then says this about Mephibosheth. Then he will have, oh, check this out. T t check out what David says about Mephibosheth. He's honoring Saul's family. Would you honor a family or even people? The, the minute you think about a person, you think I'm just going to honor the rest of y'all? Do you know what David said after he found out that his grandson, Saul's grandson, was still alive? He said that Saul, Saul's grandson, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. If that, if that ain't honor, I don't know what is. We courageously give honor. It's actually one of our 12 stones, y'all. Y'all check out the website. We honor up and down. We are, we, we're not just going to treat our leaders right. Praise God. We're going to honor them like no other. Amen? But we also got to honor our friends, too. We got to honor our family in Jesus' name, co-workers, bosses, managers, or anyone who God brings into our lives. Number two, somebody say humility. humility. David humbles himself and acknowledge that he sinned before the Lord. When we find out when, he, when, when Nathan the prophet came to him and told David about his shortcomings, David didn't, didn't hold back. He acknowledged, he said, I am a sinner. He was supposed to actually die. David was supposed to die for the sin that he committed. If most of you don't know, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 10, somewhere around there, he says that you're supposed to die for the sin that he actually committed. But God found grace for his life due to what? His humility. David immediately, someone shout immediately, realized his sin and confessed. David immediately realized his sin and confessed. In fact, Nathan lets David know later in 2 Samuel that the Lord has put away your sin, and guess what? You shall not surely die. There is grace that God gives you when you maintain a heart of humility. David is teaching us a key principle of how to overcome our heart problems. And I want you to touch your neighbor on this and don't, don't yell at them, okay? Just a nice, simple, gentle touch and just tell them, humble yourself. Humble yourself. If you want to see success in your life, humble yourself. If you want the manifestation of God's blessing over your life, humble yourself. If you want to see the fruit of the prophetic word expansion in your life, you have to do what? Humble yourself. Woo! Number three. It's the last point, y'all. It's the last point. 
when I gave this last point, y'all, I'm going to be honest. I was crying the third service. I was preaching to myself. When the word hits you, I'm telling you, when the word hits you, man, I, I, I don't know when it hits me. Let me say not what hurts you. When the word hits me, it just hits me in, in tears. I don't know why. I just get overwhelmed with God's presence. So number three, how, you over, how, how, how do I overcome my heart problems? Number three, God's word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might what? Not sin against thee. Psalm 119 and 11. The ultimate way to deal with any heart trouble is by diving deeper into his word. As you dive deeper into his word, you're also in fact seeking him. And as you seek him, he begins to create in you what? A clean heart. Thank you, Donnie McClurkland. From Psalm 51, 10 to 13, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away. Don't cast me away. Don't cast me away and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. This does not sound like someone who wrote it from a prideful heart. This sounds like someone who was back at their worst situation. I know I caused this problem for myself. I know people are after me, but I'm still going to honor. I know I wasn't done right, but I'm still going to show humility. Restore to me the verse 12, 51, 10, verse 12, Psalm. Y'all want to take that scripture home? Psalm 51, 10 to 13, I'm reading. I'm at verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. What? And sinners shall be converted to you. There's going to be salvation behind your heart. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted? He overcame with the word of God. But I saw something deeper at play here. Uh, as I looked at the scripture of Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted, the devil really tried to get Jesus to forfeit his ministry. He tried to get Jesus into idol worship. The devil asked Jesus to bow down and uh, the devil asked Jesus to bow down and worship him. And tried his heart when he said, I will give you the kingdoms of the world and their glory. See, the devil tried to prove Jesus to be a fool and forfeit his ministry. Because the devil knew that if he can get him to forfeit his ministry, that there are people connected to him that will never receive salvation. Courageous church doesn't happen. You don't get saved. Mama don't get saved. Great granddaddy, grandmama don't get saved. This is ultimately why the enemy consistently fights you because he wants you to forfeit your ministry. He doesn't want your testimony to get out. He doesn't want your voice to get out. He doesn't want to see you succeed because he knows that if you go forward in ministry, there are people connected to you that will never give their lives to Christ. This is why we have the word in our hearts. This is why we have a courageous life. This is why we preach from week to week. This is, this is why, so we can have the weapons necessary. I mean, the, by the word, we, we need the word. And you can rightly divide it, too, because when Jesus was tempted, and I, I, I didn't say this in the first service, okay? Y'all get a, something real nice right now. He was tempted with the word. Like, like, he didn't even use something that was, like, worldly to really try to rattle Jesus. The devil's not going to use something worldly to rattle you. He's going to use something inside the church, pervert it, and present it to you to see if you know your word. And by perverted, I mean twisted. It could be the word. It could be. It sounds good to the ear. But if it sounds good to the ear, thank God for the Holy, the Holy Spirit that, go, yeah, that will give you the conviction to be like, that sounds good. 
but I could the, the spirit is kind of telling me there's more to this so you go home you open up your Bible and you start to dig and dig and dig I'm not gonna make a decision without digging in God's Word because I know by the revelation that I got here when Jesus was tempted that the devil's gonna come probably with something within the church Here's the final thought. The testimony of David was that he was a man after God's own heart. As our opening scripture declares in Acts 13, 22, right? David's testimony still to date has never changed. Even after his shortcomings. God wanted me to tell you that, tell you all that your testimony won't be the issues of your past. Before you were in your mother's womb, I have called you and knew you. You're going to walk in the fullness. I'm speaking into your lives now. You're going to walk in the fullness of what God has for your life. And your past has no bearings on your future. Touch your neighbor. And if you could tell him without crying and tell him your past has no bearing on your future. Amen. Let's bow our heads right here. Let me pray for y'all. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for these glorious people. I thank you, Lord God, that they opened up their hearts and that they heard your word. I pray, Lord God, that you change their hearts right now in the name of Jesus. I speak life change in their hearts, Lord God. I speak like you're pricking and you're pulling on someone's heart right now, Lord God. Pull on it. What we feel right now, if you feel something, is God pulling on the reins of your heart. God is pulling on you. And Father, pull on your people, Lord God, until they know the fullness of who you are, God. Reveal yourself to them day after day after day after day. Give as much to them, Lord God, as they thirst for. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let the testimony of one be. My cup is overflowing right now because God is pouring so much into me. Pour into your people. Pour into your people. Pour into them, God. Pour into them until they want no more. Fill their cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let them, Lord God, be blessed by your word and blessed by seeking your face, Lord God. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.